right? Imagine coming up with 20 small molecule inhibitors or 20 antibody products. That's really kind of challenging to design and then understand the PKPD of that understand the safety of that. So I think up until this point, it's been really challenging. I mean, people have shied away from that. Um, but I think with the flexibility of CRISPR and base editing, where designing these guides is, is high throughput now, is, is more well understood, and potentially using some of these machine learning algorithms to guide us into what is the best combination, I think is the next step. So hello, and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video, I spoke with Ryan Murray, a PhD student at Northeastern University, where Ryan has been involved in developing an immunotherapy that involves base editing of immune cells to treat cancer. Well, firstly, uh, congratulations to you for getting out the new sort of preprints a couple of months ago, um, showing some of your research. And I mean, basically this uh, today will be mainly trying to unpack that uh, work that you've produced. So um, the work is all around CAR T cells. And I know some of my audience are probably maybe familiar with T cells being part of the immune system, but why is your focus geared around uh, CAR T cells? What exactly are they? Yeah, so I think because T cells are a major component of the immune system, they've been heavily studied as a therapeutic cell type. So what's called CAR T cells are really popular for cancer indications, but it's now moving outside of oncology as well. So CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So essentially we take usually little pieces of antibodies, which can recognize certain antigens on cancer cells and engineer those into T cells to redirect them to be able to see and specifically target cancer cells. So there's been a lot of research surrounding this and a lot of positive clinical and now commercial data showing that CAR T cells are extremely effective at treating and curing blood cancers. I see. So because, um, well, at least from my initial learning about T cells was they target foreign cells, so cells that have been infected by things like viruses. So right. um, I think this whole area of like immunology has recently been very exciting, like immunotherapies in particular, because it seems like there is this innate ability of these T cells, as you mentioned, to recognize cancer cells. Right, yeah. So they do have this innate ability, which is sort of what CAR T cells are designed to mimic. So when there is a foreign cell or an infected cell, the T cells will recognize that um, through their TCR and they will target that cell for, you know, destruction. Um, cancer has a lot of immuno evasion mechanisms. So a lot of the times they employ these strategies to prevent that interaction or to dampen that immune response so the t-cells are no longer effective against cancer um, there's a lot of um, targets that these cancers express that are also expressed on normal tissue so the t-cells may or may not see those as foreign or uh, negative and not actually kill the cancer cells as well so i'm coming up with strategies to design car t-cells either finding a really specific antigen that is more closely related to the cancer to tell the t-cells it actually is a cancer and not a normal cell or to engineer the t-cells uh, the car t-cells with something extra um, to help them evade some of those immunosuppressive strategies the cancer cells are employing is also something that's is uh, very intensely studied right now and um, so really good at designing car, t car t cells to recognize the these antigens and turn on the immune system um, they've been effective, but now I think the second sort of wave is looking at these CAR T cells and how can we bolster their efficacy? Can we make them more potent? Can we make them persist in the patients longer so they survive for an extended period of time long enough to actually eradicate the tumors? Mm. So just to clarify, these CAR T cells are sort of modified T cells that are given to patients. And then the idea is that hopefully they can target and eliminate these cancerous cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now, the, the pretty standard in the field is to extract a patient's uh, T cells, engineer them in the lab with the cars, and then put them back into the patients. So uh, things are moving sort of away from that, as you can imagine, that's really challenging to do for each individual patient, uh, especially when a lot of these patients are quite sick and can't tolerate the sort of 
processing that it takes to extract T cells from the blood, you know, wait some time to engineer them in the, the lab and give them back. So there's two really hot topics right now in the field that are allogeneic T cells. So you can take T cells from a healthy donor patient, requires a little bit more engineering to make sure that when you put those back into a cancer patient, um, they don't see those as foreign, as you are, had already brought up, because you can't you know, mix and match people's uh, cells. So they're a little bit more challenging, but you get them from a healthy donor. Um, you can put them essentially in the freezer, and whenever you need to administer them as a therapy, they're on demand, or what people consider off the shelf. So there's no delay in that engineering and processing if you took them from a patient and putting them back. And now, additionally, on top of that is just in vivo engineering. So you don't have to take the T cells out of the patient or out of the body anymore. You can inject them with certain proteins or um, strategies that might actually create the CAR T cells in the body. So again, it shortens that time to treatment um, that patients are now, you know, really struggling with waiting to get treated. So those two are sort of new and on the horizon. But for now, it's sort of the standard is taking a patient's blood out and engineering in the lab. Oh, yeah, I see. So, yeah, the standard approach is this autologous approach, whereas the patient's own cells and the idea is to shift to these allogeneic T cells. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a few times now the word engineering. Now, um, I know because I've read your preprint that you work with a CRISPR technology. And so obviously a lot of people associate CRISPR with gene editing. So would you Mm -hmm. be able to elaborate on what exactly do you mean by the term engineering? Yeah. So I think there's a bunch of different types of engineering. So there's a lot of synthetic biology strategies, a lot of gene gene editing, a lot of just rational design of these sort of mutant car proteins, because these are not natural, right? They're sort of fusions of different pieces of T cell signaling molecules and little pieces of antibodies so they can recognize these. So there's a lot of different types of engineering. Um, the preprint itself focuses on um, gene editing. So that's one sort of strategy that we can increase the potency of these T cells. And you're correct, it's focusing on a CRISPR Cas9 technology um, called face editing. So I think people are probably at least have heard the term CRISPR Cas9. It's essentially this protein that was derived from bacteria that can specifically go to regions of the genome and cut those specific areas. So it was originally a a defense mechanism for these organisms, but we've taken that and uh, re-engineered that to, you know, do highly specific genome engineering. So CRISPR is really great at going to a very specific location in the genome and creating double strand breaks, which, you know, is very good for creating knockouts or inserting certain genes. So in the preprint, um, we've taken sort of the, the next step in engineering those proteins and are u- utilizing base editing. So it's the same principle, except these proteins don't create double strand breaks. They just actually specifically modify one DNA base pair to another. So specifically, we're using this um, ABE base editor, which will change um, an A base to a G base. So. There's no need for double strand breaks. You're not actually cutting any of the genome. And because of that, we can actually really nicely multiplex and and gene edit multiple genes at once um, because there's no genotoxicity associated with cutting up the DNA in multiple places. As you can imagine, you know, cells don't really like if things are going to be cut and sort of free-floating DNA and then re-sticking that back together properly is really challenging and creates a lot of uh, negative effects. So to get around that, if we want to uh, do multiple edits at once, we can utilize this this newer technology of CRISPR, which is base editing, um, and re- really just specifically change those base pairs without the need for double strand breaks. Mm, I see. So what are the sort of like functional impacts of these base changes? So obviously, if you do a sort of canonical CRISPR double strand break, often that's sort of like in Jesus uh, insertions, deletions, and sort of mutates that region. And so obviously, uh, for context, you're trying to edit particular genes, um, I mm-hmm. believe. And so what, how, what sort of like uh, impacts can you achieve by just changing an A to G in terms of modifying what happens to that gene? Right. So for um, this work in particular, we were looking at gene knockouts. So we are looking to create these CAR T cells that are more 
resistant to all those immunosuppressive pathways in the tumor microenvironment. So I've alluded to before that CAR T cells are really good at treating and curing blood cancers, but they haven't really been great at doing the same for solid tumors. So breast cancers, lung cancers, um, because these tumors, you know, are, are a physical mass and they create this microenvironment that is much more immunosuppressive compared to, you know, there's not really a concentrated microenvironment for a blood cancer as it's pretty well dispersed throughout the body. So this creates a, a really concentrated area of proteins that will turn off the immune system, um, that will completely silence the immune system. It will polarize a lot of these other immune cells that are within the cancer microenvironment to make them pro-cancerous instead of anti-cancer. So it's a much more challenging barrier for the CAR T cells or the immune system in general. And if you, um, you know, think about it, cancer has many, many different ways that it can evade the immune system. I think people are probably also have heard the, the buzzword PD-1. Um, this anti-PD-1 immunotherapy has shown great results in the clinic, um, but not completely curative in some cases. And in those instances, right, the cancer can just utilize other strategies to evade the immune system. So you block PD-1, it has 10 things on reserve that it can still utilize to block the immune system. So really we wanted to understand in this preprint, what are some of those other mechanisms and can we find different pathways that might synergize in their immunosuppressive capacity? And can we alleviate those bar barriers? So in that instance, we want to do something that's more than one, maybe more than two, in this case, up to six edits. And in order to do that, we needed to use a gene editing strategy, such as base editing, which wouldn't cut up the genome with all of those different edits. I see. And so actually, when I was reading your uh, paper, like one of the things that I thought was interesting was one of the modifications you make is in the adenosine receptor. And mm -hmm. so is this a more recently emerged pathway in terms of suppressing T cell activity or how much is really known about it? I think that it's um, a relatively well-known pathway for immune suppression. So actually my lab at Northeastern, uh, my PI, Misha Sikovsky, sort of was a, a pioneer of this pathway and figuring out how does this work to um, suppress T cells and NK cells uh, in the immune system and found that it's a really potent suppressor. So um, adenosine is sort of highly generated in the tumor microenvironment as it is uh, metabolized from ATP. So all the cells in the tumor microenvironment, especially rapidly dividing cancer cells are utilizing up ATP, creating ATP at high rates and is then degraded into adenosine, which is free floating in the environment. And that is then picked up by um, certain cells of the immune system, which then turns them off. So it is one byproduct of cancer itself, of just having a high metabolic rate that then generates this adenosine, which in turn turns off the immune system. So I think it's well known that this has effects on dampening the immune system. It's normally utilized in um, like wound healing as well. So it has a positive benefit. It's just been co-opted by cancer. Um, and it's just now starting to be understood that we can apply this to bolster CAR T cell activity um, for immunotherapies. So I think the, the pathway is well known and we just wanted to see, can we apply that to T cells? A couple of labs have looked at this and utilized siRNA or CRISPR-Cas9 to knock this down and have shown improvements. So we sort of started there as well with base editing and we're like, can we show that we can also knock this protein out and benefit T cells? Um, which seems to be the case. Um, I guess you can go back to your previous question, which how do we actually do that? And how do we actually get rid of these proteins? So we can design these editors to go to specific regions in the genome, let's say for the adenosine receptor, and it can make those specific base pair changes. What we're looking for are regions of the genome that um, are start sites. So where the gene starts, it's uh, transcription translation, um, we could disrupt that start site so that never begins and that protein, that mRNA is never created and then that protein in turn is never created, resulting in a knockdown. Or we can look at specific regions of intron exon splice junctions. So typically, you know, the exons are the coding regions and all the introns are spliced out to create a functional protein. We can target those, those junctions which are pretty highly conserved within the genome 
And if those are disrupted, the exons are not spliced properly, and that usually leads to nonsense mediated decay, and that protein is never created. So we can knock out proteins with this editor in two sort of different ways by preventing any initiation with the start codon or disrupting how they're properly spliced and put together, you know, effectively negating their proper translation and doesn't create new proteins. Mm, interesting. And so like, how long does it take you to sort of identify or screen different ways of trying to achieve this knockdown of these different uh, genes? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, CRISPR is really efficient at this since it has a pretty ubiquitous PAM motif. So there are three specific nucleotides that CRISPR can recognize that we can guide it to in the genome. So there's a lot of different places you can put CRISPR into the genome and it will just cut anywhere, which is pretty efficient. Base setting is a little bit more um, restrictive in that way because I just described, you sort of need to find an A in one of those two regions in the start coronary or splice site. Um, so those are a little bit more restrictive. And then once we find an A that is within that protospacer sequence, so that also has a three nucleotide sequence that um, we can guide the base editor to, it needs to be in this sort of what we call an editing window. So there's um, a deaminase fused to this CRISPR-Cas system now, um, since the system itself cannot create double strand breaks. If they've been engineered to have a deaminase, which will actually do the chemical conversion of that A to G. So if it's not in this certain editing window, which is close to that protospatial sequence, the efficiency can be really low to no editing efficiency. So um, for those reasons, we need specific regions of the genome, and they need to be relatively close to where the cast is going to sit within the genome. It can make screening for these sometimes difficult, um, but uh, we, we've been very efficient in how we can design these and screen these um, and sort of turn through them relatively quickly in hopes of finding a spot in the genome that can be editable. I see. And in terms of making all these edits within the T-cell, you describe the fact that you can multiplex. And so are all these six edits that you describe in the paper being done at the same time? Or is it the sort of like sequential? You have the same cell, but you just over time edit it. Yeah, I think I think the sequential strategy is something that other places are employing. Um, because again, doing a bunch of these modification, modifications at once might be uh, not advantageous for a cell, especially going to more sensitive cell types like a stem cell or a neuron, um, or if you're using double strand breaks and you can't cut all of these at once. T cells seem highly amenable to this editing strategy and base editing doesn't generate double strand breaks. So we just do all the editing all at once. So we introduce an mRNA that will encode the editor. And then we introduce six separate guide RNAs that will guide that editor to six different places in the genome and edit all six of those locations at once. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I guess uh, once you identify correctly edited cells, the, the T cells, that's a way to sort of expand them or how do you go about um, sort of storing these modified cells? Yeah. So in the beginning of the process, like a typical CAR T process, essentially you would start with either patient T cells or donor derived T cells, which is what we were starting with, um, do all of the editing and the CAR engineering up front. So we introduce the CAR via lentiviral vector. Um, and then we just expand them in vitro per the normal process that everyone else is using for CARs, you know, in media with uh, exogenous cytokine. And at the end, we freeze them down and then they would be ready if they were a therapy um, to be dosed into a patient. Um, but then we just saw them out and do all of our QC and analytical assays on them to make sure that all of those edits happened and to what degree. And then we stress test them in an in vitro and in vivo setting to make sure that biologically that those knockouts um, have a substantial effect, right? Making sure that they're doing what we think they are doing both in and outside uh, an in vivo model system. I see. I see. Um, you described already how the edits you're making, part of them are uh, to actually a phase like immune suppression, so the, mm -hmm. the cancer suppressing the T cells. But what are the other important properties that are needed to have like effective or as you described, stealthy T cells for this therapy to be more effective? Yeah, so the, the main crux of the paper was to look at these sort of different 
orthogonal pathways of immune suppression. So up front, we started with the adenosine receptor and showed that we can, you know, for the first time, use base editing to knock that protein down and make these T cells resistant to adenosine mediated suppression. Sort of been shown before with siRNA and CRISPR, but we were happy to see that base editing can also be used for this. But again, the cancer cells have so many different pathways that they can uh, evade the immune system. So we took those adenosine res resistant cells and subjected them to other pathways that we found in our model that were highly upregulated, that were relatively common in multiple cancers, um, namely PD-1 and TGF-beta. And we showed that our adenosine resistant cells still were suppressed by these. So you can imagine you put in a cell that has a single knockout, it goes into the patient's tumor microenvironment, it sees all these other pathways, it still doesn't work. Hmm. So I think that's been the major problem with these, some of these monotherapies or combo therapies for immunotherapy right now, is it's really only one or two pathways. And these, these cell therapies are still being suppressed. So we then showed if we remove all three of these proteins, abrogating signaling from all three of these pathways, it really benefits and bolsters the T cell effector function in some of our animal models. So we're happy to see that, you know, multiplex gene editing um, in this combinatorial fashion can really enhance CAR T cell potency in the cell tumor microenvironment, but we really wanted to make it translational. So it's great that we've shown combining uh, resistance to immunosuppression uh, creates a superior product, but as I alluded to before in the beginning, you know, everyone is moving towards this either in vivo editing or allogeneic for uh, the, the multitude of benefits that both of those avenues have. So we are thinking we want to show that one base editing is really powerful and can add more and more edits, right? So far, we haven't been restricted to the number of edits that we can do in, in the T cell at, at simultaneously. So we want to show that power and flexibility but also make this more realistic, right? We wanted to show that we can also make an allogeneic CAR T cell that is super potent and effective in um, the tumor microenvironment. So after we found those potency edits to uh, reverse the immune suppression, we added in three additional edits that we termed stealth edits to sort of shield these CAR T cells from um, immune rejection. So again, if we took someone uh, someone else's patient cells and mix them with the healthy donor cells, they would be seen as foreign and they would start, you know, killing each other. So we want to prevent that graft versus host or host versus graft disease in our cells. So what we did was um, utilize base editing and we targeted the TCR. So we removed the TCR from our CAR T cells. So in that regard, these T cells, when put into a patient, would no longer see that patient's body as foreign and it would prevent that graft versus host disease. We also layered on two additional edits, um, targeting HLA class one and HLA class two. So in that instance, when we put these cells back into the patient, the patient's body will no longer be able to recognize uh, HLAs on these T cells and see them as foreign and remove them. So um, typically that's a, a major problem with allogeneic cell therapy is these therapies don't last too long in the patients long enough to enact their effector function because the patients still have an immune system and are recognizing these therapies as foreign and clearing, clearing them out of the body relatively quickly. So we added those three edits into our CAR T cell product to show that it could be translational to the clinic. And what we did was um, put these into a humanized mouse model. So these mice uh, have a human immune system. So you can imagine that they're probably as close to a patient as we can get in a rodent system. Um, so when we inject our CAR T cells into these mice, they have a human immune system which can recognize these as foreign and clear them out. We've shown that in the paper um, that pretty readily, you know, after a couple of weeks, we have no detectable CAR T cells left because the mouse human immune system did its job. Um, but when we add in these stealth edits to prevent that uh, removal or allo rejection in these mice, we can show that they not only persist a uh, number of weeks, months, but these cells um, actually can enact their full effector function and fully clear tumors. So one, we added the potency edit, so they're more potent within the tumor microenvironment, but then the stealth edits actually allow them to remain within this model system or in a patient for longer to actually get to the cancer and uh, eradicate the tumors.
Oh, cool. So just to clarify, you were initially always editing like human T cells, which is why you then needed to have the humanized mouse model. So how do you actually like generate these uh, humanized immune system in within the, the mice? So these are genetically modified mice that themselves do not have an immune system or do not have a fully developed immune system. So typically these are used for oncology studies or infectious disease studies because it's easy to introduce, um, in this case, you know, uh, a cancer model because it can't be rejected by the immune system. So they're sort of a blank slate. Um, that's a standard in the field. And then on top of that, we just utilized um, human stem cells. So these mice can be infused with human CD34 stem cells, and they will just go into the bone marrow and graft and then start producing all of the immune cells that um, they would normally produce, any of the blood cells, any of the immune cells. So uh, after a number of weeks, um, these mice sort of have a fully functional human immune system, and then we can utilize that as a surrogate for what we may or may not see within a patient. Of course, that's not fully translated, translatable because it's a mouse, but it's as close as we can get um, before going to some of these higher order model systems like um, non-human primates, which is probably the closest you could get to a human. But at least they have the uh, a competent human immune system, and we can show that it's able to clear some of our CAR T cells and see them as foreign, which sort of replicates what everyone's seeing in the clinic. I see. And so uh, how do you then actually mimic the cancers or what type of solid uh, tumors in this case were you trying to uh, mimic? So in the paper, we chose two different models of lung cancer. So we were specifically focused on lung cancer. Um, we had screened a number of different solid tumor model systems, um, anywhere from pancreatic um, to melanoma to breast to ovarian. And really what we did up front was phenotype all of these different cancer cells and try to understand what immunosuppressive pathways might be highly upregulated across these. So we were very focused on the adenosine pathway coming from my lab at Northeastern. So we were sort of looking at tumor types that had a high expression of this pathway. Lung cancer, one of the lung cancers we found was really high expressing of this pathway. So we started with that um, just because we were mainly focused on the knockout of the adenosine receptor. So we want to make sure there's a lot of adenosine in the system and can we prevent that immune suppression. After we chose that lung cancer model and realized there might be other stuff in the tumor microenvironment we need to be wary of, we just stuck with that model, um, more deeply characterized that and found it also highly expressed other suppressive pathways that we we're interested in, which sort of was the, the lead on to the paper. And we were like, okay, we have this tool it can multiplex gene edit. We found multiple pathways of suppression. Let's see if we can layer some on and really protect these T cells. Mm, interesting. And so um, now that you've shown in some preclinical evidence in the humanized mice, what kind of is like the next stage or where, where do you see this heading next? Yeah, I think that um, this was just a great POC to show, you know, there are pathways within the tumor microenvironment that can be synergistic um, if removed. So, you know, there might be certain pathways that you remove both and there's no additive effect, right? They, they, they sort of feed into the same type of pathway of how they would suppress the T cells. We sort of try to pick different ones that would have different suppressive function. And it does seem like the more we remove, the more benefit we see for the T cells. So I think that this um, can extend beyond that, right? So can we do seven? Can we do eight? Can we find other pathways that are more synergistic? I think it's going to be relatively challenging, right? Um, if you can think of doing a 10 plex edit or a 20 plex edit, how do you how do you rationally design that? I think it was a little challenging already to come up with combinations of things and to test them in the lab and in the mice. So I really see that this as a really great avenue for AI machine learning. I know that's buzzy mm. and everyone is into that now, <laughs> but if you can imagine trying to come up with the best combination of 20 edits, how do you pick those pathways? It sort of seems almost limitless, but I think with the advent of machine learning, it can really understand what are these pathways? How do they interplay with each other? 
what might be the most important and the least important, and how do those actually combine to suppress the T cells. So I think we're probably heading in that direction of utilizing machine learning more for a rational design. But I think up until that point, just really diving deeper into these tumor microenvironments, trying to best understand, you know, what does this look like? What immune cells are there? Because once we understand what immune cells are there, we might understand what pathways they're using to suppress um, the immune system, because a lot of them are polarized to pro-cancer. And then above and beyond that, what are the cancer cells and those pro-cancer immune cells secreting? You know, there's a lot of small things, biochemical things like adenosine that they're secreting. There's a lot of proteins and chemokines and cytokines that they're secreting, which can also suppress the immune system. So really understanding what that TME fingerprint looks like, I think will be an advantage to sort of more rationally design these combinatorial edits. Right now, I think people are starting where we started and saying, there's a lot of adenosine, let's remove that. And not really thinking of all of those other things, mm. because it's not usually that straightforward to design something for 20 targets, right? Imagine coming up with 20 small molecule inhibitors or 20 antibody products. That's really kind of challenging to design and then understand the PKPD of that, understand the safety of that. So I think up until this point, it's been really challenging. People have shied away from that. Um, but I think with the flexibility of CRISPR and base editing, where designing these guides is, is high throughput now, is, is more well understood, and potentially using some of these machine learning algorithms to guide us into what is the best combination, I think is the next step. Yeah, I mean, you for sure have hit all the uh, buzzwords, CRISPR, yeah. T cells, <laughs> and AI, uh, AI as well. Um, but in the paper, you uh, to achieve some of these more edits, you also used like Cas12b, is that right? Like, so yes. you, were you using two different types of CRISPR systems to achieve the multiplexing? Yeah, so originally due to those restrictive targeting sites of base editing where we really needed somewhere close to the protospacer, um, and somewhere that we could edit in that start or one of those splicers. And you don't always find a high editing um, guide. So for the target that we we're targeting, which is TGF beta receptor two, we didn't find high efficiency editing. Um, we could have used something that was a little bit lower editing, but we decided let's try a different editor. So you could use a different base editor. There are a lot of different flavors of base editors of where they can be um, delivered to what types of things they edit, etc. Um, but we used a nuclease because CRISPR typically is really easy to place anywhere in the genome and is really good at cutting, highly efficient at cutting. So we weren't concerned that we would get low efficacy um, with the generation of those double strand breaks. So we switched to using a nucleus called Cas12b, which actually has an alternative PAM sequence to the base editor. So that means that they're going to go to different regions in the genome. So there's no worry that, you know, the, the nuclease would then be guided to where the base editor should be guided to and vice versa. So they're going to only be editing with the guides that are specific to them. So they have different protospacers and different scaffold sequences. So it really was amenable to um, multiplexing. If we had used the traditional Cas9, which has the same scaffold and same um, PAM motif as the base editor, it might get guided to where the base editor was oh, and then generate all of these double strand breaks that we didn't want in the first place. So we chose Cas12b um, because we knew it would have high efficiency in editing and it could be multiplexed with Abe. Um, we found that it was really efficient at knocking out the TGF beta receptor too. Um, so we just layered that in again to show some novelty that we can pair these things together because there's also some implications, you know, where you might want to add something into the genome. Base editing is not typically great at that because it doesn't generate double strand breaks. And you really need to break apart the genome to insert a gene where you want. Um, so that gives us that flexibility of do we want to insert a car somewhere specific? We would use a nuclease. Do we want to insert you know, some of these cytokine receptors? We would need a nuclease. So it really gives us that flexibility for next steps of we do want to insert something specifically into the genome. Um, that being said, you know, we sort of went back and design some new guides with the Abe editor um, to target other components of the TGF beta receptor 
and we can actually get high efficiency editing with the base editor so we can do all of them with the abe now but um, i think it was really amazing to see that we could be flexible with our editor choice and gives us you know that additional um, potential to insert something if we so needed to yeah i think that's one of the awesome things about crispr and especially uh well how much uh much level that's not really a word but the, the idea that once you've got the the cast nine protein it's just about adding in the rnas the guide rnas which right. obviously are much smaller in size compared to the protein right. which helps with multiplexing um it's, mm -hmm. at least that's my understanding right yeah yes and so how would the then what are the, the challenges of going from this system to actually getting it in vivo as you mentioned earlier as being like another sort of therapeutic approach as i think delivery from my more naive perspective is like the main challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for, for CAR T cells, definitely delivery is, is a huge challenge. So a lot of the delivery systems right now are uh, based on LNPs and just getting them to specifically traffic or engineer the T cells in the body is quite challenging just based on the nature of their chemistry. They really preferentially go to the liver. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you'll probably see a lot of um, news about liver di type diseases. And those are probably why they're being chosen first, because they're really easily accessible for editing based on the LMPs. Um, CAR T cell in vivo engineering right now, I think is, is modest. So the efficiency is quite low um, and making sure it's specific is, is quite challenging. So, you know, you don't want to go in and edit B cells or you don't want to go in and edit macrophages potentially. So it's going to a bunch of other cell types that could have negative effects. Um, in theory, if the car is designed properly and it's only targeting cancer, it shouldn't be that toxic. But again, you sort of lose that, um, control over your system where we can do all of our editing outside the body if something went wrong or the batch didn't look right or the editing wasn't good you just wouldn't use that you, you see it and that wouldn't be a therapy in the body i think the the risk tolerance is a lot lower because you do lose that control so i, I think for now the delivery to get them specifically and stably to t-cells has been a challenge and there's a ton of different labs a ton of different companies that are working on strategies of making this more specific and delivering them to t cells so i know L lmp is is uh, high on everyone's list maybe sort of redirecting them to only go to t cells um, there's a lot of viruses that are being modified because we know in the lab viruses very easily infect t cells so that's another mode of delivery that people are trying to use but has relatively low capacity for what genes you can, you know, and, or what delivery cargo you can use to engineer the T-cells. And there's some fesosomes which are, are more um, directed towards T-cells that can actually deliver these payloads in vivo as well. So I think those are sort of the three major buckets that people are using. But right now it's, it's relatively um, nascent fields for CAR T-cell therapy, but there's also some other areas outside of oncology where you don't really need a high number of T cells or them to last for a long time to enact their function. So we're seeing some of those avenues take off now and that might really help with some of these um, delivery developments because the bar is much lower in some of these other indications where you'll need you know, a small percentage of T cells to be transduced and then enact their function for a small amount of time. Whereas cancer, you, know, you really need to overwhelm the cancer and overwhelm that amount of suppression that it's bringing. So you really need a large number of T cells that are anti-cancer and they really need to stay in the body for as long as possible to fully eradicate that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that um, now that we're going outside of oncology with some of these delivery techs for T cells, that that will um, put a lot more resources behind developing these delivery techs. And it might we might see a new resurgence coming back for um, oncology with stronger, more specific delivery. Ah, oh, interesting. And so it seems definitely then like the most short term promising solution is these allogeneic uh, approaches. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess even from that, if you can have these like super T cells, is there some uh, logic that there could be a sort of universal anti cancer CAR T cell? Or is it always to cast the, the chimeric antigen receptor itself that needs to be different for each cancer? 
Yeah, I think people use the term universal um, CAR T cell for that allogeneic purpose. So you can think of, you know, you just create one T cell, which is shielded from the immune system, and you can use it for anyone everywhere. Or um, they have some of these universal CAR T cells, which you can much more easily swap out that car, right? The ones that we use right now are engineered in the lab and the car that we put in is the car that stays there. There are some other companies that sort of are a little bit more modular and can be modular in the patient as well, where they sort of infuse the cancer targeting portion of the car into the patient and it creates the car in vivo. So if you need to switch your targeting moiety, you can actually just infuse different ones and they'll stick to the CAR T-cell. So those are also another type of universal. I think uh, universal antigen is is probably a little bit more challenging. I think depending on the cancer or even the subtype of cancer, they all have different things that we would like to target. Um, I think the CD19 space um, for some of these B-cell leukemias and lymphomas is as universal as we might get um, just because it's it's a marker that identifies a B cell and these cancers happen to be in B cells. So that is sort of a little bit more wider spread for these B cell leukemias where it's more of a universal antigen. Um, but then we wouldn't be able to use a CD19 for like a lung cancer, let's say. So I think the targeting universality is probably more limited, but creating a universal CAR T cell, whether it's fully stealth and not going to be uh, allo-rejected or flexible and changing that antigen, um, I think are definitely things that are on the horizon. Um, but not to say that, you know, some of these solid tumors might have similar antigens. So just because I use the model system in the paper, but just because we use lung cancer doesn't mean we couldn't have used breast cancer with that same car. So there is a little bit of flexibility there, um, just finding cancers that express the same antigens. Um, and they would just be a smaller subset. I see. And so how long do you think it will take for some of these um, like preclinical stage approaches to actually get to clinical trials? Yeah, I think gene editing in general is very new. Um, so I think there's been a little bit of a hang up with regulatory bodies of, are we comfortable with gene editing? Do we understand gene editing or not? Um, Because all of these phase one trials, right, are from a regulatory perspective, mainly focused on safety. And they don't want to put in these new technologies, which sort of have been rapid fire developed, right? I think um, the CRISPR resurgence or explosion was really only came out in, you know, 2015, 2016. um, And already we have these these technologies in in people and have cured people. Um, So typically a drug development cycle could be 10, 20, 30 years and the CRISPR revolution sort of has shrunk that completely. So I think it's great that we're starting to get things into patients and seeing that these these types of strategies are really effective and actually have been really safe. So I think that is just going to sort of open up this um, regulatory landscape and what can we do? How can we be a little bit more innovative in how we view these therapies. We're learning a lot in the lab and R&D of developing certain analytical tools to make sure that these are what we think they are and make sure that they are as safe as we think they are. So I think that is is really coming up quickly. And I think once we have a few of these in clinical trials, I think the pace will be much quicker. It's already been, I think, lightning speed, but I think coming from something coming from scratch right now Typically, you would say, you know, it won't be in people for 20 years because that's just normal drug development life cycle. But I think just the flexibility of these tools and how much we're learning about these tools and how powerful they are. There's so many companies and so many labs putting a lot of resources behind studying these things that we're we're learning so much so quickly that I think this has really been shortened. So I would not be surprised if we saw something brand new, some of these new technologies, right? Like a prime editor or some gene writing or all these gene circuits, which are relatively new. I wouldn't be surprised to see some of those from idea to phase ones in somewhere five, six years at this point. They're sort of all building on each other. Um, but yeah, I think I think the pace is increasing, which is great. You know, uh, I think that's the only way to really find out if they're effective is to get them into phase one and try to help as many patients as possible. So I think 
the industry, you know, as researcher, I'm really excited to see some of that reality and see how these things are working. And then, you know, for the patients, like they're waiting for these therapies and having to wait 20 years for someone to develop something, some of these more intricate therapies is a, is a hindrance, right? It's a struggle. So I think now that we can do things more quickly, iteratively, again, with high throughput stuff, with machine learning, potentially, I think this is going to go much, much faster in the, in the future. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's definitely a lot of potential, but we have to obviously be careful and make sure um, right. it's going to be effective and safe at the same time. So right. I know right now from having spoken to you offline that you're now, uh, as I, a similar position to myself a couple of months ago in the thesis writing stage. Um, right. So uh, while I know you're going to be busy doing all that, uh, what other things are, are you excited to see on the like the horizon? Yeah, um, I think that a lot of these combinations, I'm biased because the paper was gene editing combinations. Um, I think anything combination though is going to be really important moving forward. We're seeing now a lot in the in the context of cancer. You know, can we combine? multiple biologics. I think that's shown a, a ton of promise by combining a PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade. So that's showing more efficacy over um, just PD-1 itself. Just recently, we saw some data come out that was PD-1 lag-3. Shows much more efficacy over PD-1 itself. Um, combination with either those immunotherapies with oncolytic virus or CAR-Ts with oncolytic virus, I think we're really starting to understand that being as restrictive as we were before, you know, biology is really complex, human diseases are really complex, but choosing something that we knew, you know, this is the one target, this is the one molecule for that one target, we're really good at that, but it's just not, it's just not complex enough to really address the challenges that we're seeing in real human health. And now we're just, I think, on the edge of realizing, you know, these single modalities are just not really going to cut it. And how can we best combine them? Whether it's combining a bunch of gene edits, maybe, but maybe we need to combine those combination of gene edits with an oncolytic virus. So that's something that I think is on the forefront. Everyone's really trying to understand how do we best combine technologies, which makes it even more challenging, right? <laughs> Typically, you're an expert in one specific thing and now you need these other things. You don't really understand them fully enough to combine them. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot more crosstalk between labs, between companies, between partnerships um, to really, you know, think we need to come up with a best therapeutic. And how do we do that? We need to sort of work together. So I'm hoping that that is, is the trend in the industry and in academia is, is really combining all of these things to combat how complicated any of these human diseases are. Yeah, yeah, well said. I mean, I agree. Science is challenging, but also very rewarding. And especially when you can have that element of creativity as well to create something successful. So, well, yeah, firstly, thank you for speaking with me today and breaking down that preprint. Hopefully it does get accepted and published uh, sometime soon. Um, and yeah, best of luck with the write-up for your thesis. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me. I had a great time.